Here we are, AC. What a special time to be alive, all right? So, AC, as a dad of two sons, given how vocal you were during the transition, you were actually on uh, major networks in South Africa and across the region. Um, you were also facing threats of arrests, and, as well as on your life. Um, were you not afraid? You know, my house was patrol bombed two times. The last 10 days before the president stepped down, I couldn't leave in the house. Today it was the intelligence, tomorrow it was the military, the next day it's the police. So to answer your question, was I, was I not scared? I was. I was scared because my sisters and I, five of them, they didn't, they never chose this life. They didn't choose to have a brother who's into politics where my decisions affect theirs. It affects their livelihood, it affects their safety, it affects their employment. My mother didn't choose to have a son who's into politics. And I was scared for them. I was scared for my children. But you know what I was really scared of, Farai? I was scared of what would happen if we didn't go to war. I was scared of what would happen if I didn't fight. That's what really frightened me. You know, like I, you know, I spoke about nine years ago, I had a son and I had to send him out of the country. He lives out of the country right now and now I've got this new son and I'm thinking, do I let him grow up in a country with still no water? Do I let him grow up still in a country with no opportunities for him? Do I let him grow up in a country with dilapidating schools? Do I let him grow up in a country where everybody gets an education and they can't wait to get away? That's what I was really afraid of. Reflecting back, do you have any regrets? Specifically, and I'm sure everyone that's watching this interview would want to know if you regret saying F you to former President Robert Mugabe. Four days ago now, I wrote a letter and I sent it to the president's uh, former residence. In the letter, I apologized to President Mugabe for the words I used in the midst of a war that was very messy. War is very messy, and it turns you into more of what you really are. When you are under pressure, we learn who you really are. And in the mess of the chaos, I became a messy fighter. What I said in that moment when I watched the clip, it makes me irk. My stomach turns when I watch myself saying that to not only a man who had fought so hard to liberate this country, but had brought it such a long way, but I was frustrated. And that moment in captured my absolute frustration. And I am so sorry that I became that person. God forbid my children ever think that's how you express your frustration. And I am sorry, I regret it, but I regret a lot of things that this fight made us become. Look at what this fight made us as Zimbabweans. For I, we hate each other. No, Zimbabweans do not want to see other Zimbabweans successful. If you become successful in this country, they say you're a thief. And you know why they say that? Because it has become so hard to be successful that when you see anybody else successful, they must have cheated the process. So we attack success. It's not okay to want to be a millionaire in this country, and I regret that our journey has broken us so much that we fail to be positive even when there is every reason to be positive. And I hope that's one of the things the new rainbow of a country is going to bring for us. You know, Jay-Z, in his latest interview in the New York Post, talks about going to therapy and the benefits of therapy for him. Would you go to therapy, AC? And what would be the big issues that you would talk about that you've never talked about um, to anyone? I come from a very broken past. I didn't know who my biological father was until I was 25 years old. So I grew up without a map. Everything I ever did in life, 
I wandered my way through. I didn't have a big brother to protect me when I got bullied. I had to figure out how to fight by myself. I didn't have a father to tell me what to do on the first date. So I treated women how I saw them being treated where I came from. I broke so many hearts because of my insecurity. I went after insecure girls so that they could fill me up. Because I was so empty, I needed to steal out of you. And it's this massive insecurity of being born in a broken place. And I realize as I get older the damage it has done to me. Now I have sons. And I want to give them a good example. And I realize I must ad attend to this. I must deal with it. I would deal with that. With the insecurities of coming from a broken place. Where I have hurt everybody who's ever loved me. And because I was so terrible at everything, I indulged myself in my work. That's why I can excel in my politics and completely fail everywhere else. Mm. Mm. Um, switching gears a little, AC. Um, you were arrested and jailed. Uh, you have never talked about your experiences in prison. What was your experience like? I, I was jailed for a total of about six weeks. And I'll give you an example. So I was, when I was at Remand before I went to Chikurubi, there was about 2,000 of us sharing four toilets. About 2,000 of us sharing two functional showers. And more than the effect it had on me, I realized the faults in our justice system. When you're speaking about a correctional center or a correctional facility, the idea is to correct people so they come out better. Absolutely. When I went in prison, I learned so much about crime. When I came out, I could have been a worse criminal. Mm. We have to reform our correctional service. And we have a lot of young, bright lawyers being produced in this country that we need to put them to task to reform this. I slept next to a man every night, Sakuru Gora, who was in prison for stealing potatoes and he was in the D-class where they put murderers and rapists for stealing potatoes. And for three years, the only reason he's been there for three years is he has no access to a lawyer to make sure his follow-up court date has been adhered to. Loopholes and faults such as this, we can correct very quickly, and I intend on pressing it upon this government to make sure we fix that. And talking about you pressing upon this government to fix that, what is your role in the new government? as Zimbabwe char charges its way forward? I'm a youth empowerment champion, mm -hmm. all right? That's, when you look into all the messages I've always tried to sell, I'm about youth empowerment. Four years ago, we worked very hard uh, to get the 25% youth quota uh, mainstreamed in government, to make sure young people have access, at least a quota access to everything government does, to make sure young people have 25% access to land. Young people have 25% access to licenses. Why do we not have a young person who owns a radio station? Why do we not have a young person who owns a television station? A young person who owns a mining concession? Why do we not have young people who sit on government boards? Are you telling us we're not capable enough? I want to see that 25% come into effect because I think when young people are representing themselves in these platforms, then young people will be mainstreamed. So ultimately, my role in this government is to push harder on the affirmative acceptance of the youth quota. We want to see young people taking more roles, taking more responsibility. It's like a relay. I want to see this relay, the baton being passed from the generation that is there right now, which is desperate to pass the baton. I tell you, Emerson Mnangagwa, the president, wants to pass the baton, but he looks at us, and what noise does he see us making when he looks at our generation, we're tweeting out of control. We're Facebooking out of control. We're wrecking at each other out of control. I want to see a transition of that button stick coming to us in this relay. And we're not only in position, but we're also ready and capable. And quickly, AC, then shouldn't the elders be grooming us? And are they grooming us? No. They're not. But that's also because we haven't made ourselves available for it. General Chiwenga 
as he leads Operation Restore Legacy, understands there is a youth component, which is how do we empower our young people. But for him to push on that, for ZANU-PF to push on that, for the war veteran government to push on that, do we not have to be in a position where it can be pushed for? If they said right now, we want to mainstream young people into farming, how many of us are ready? If they said right now, we want to give all government procurement to young people, how many of us have organized ourselves for that? If they said right now, we want to make sure young people are now taking part in the 5% uh, financial inclusion quota set by the Reserve Bank, how many of us even have business plans? Are we even ready? So it's not just about them it's mentoring about us. us. It's about us being ready to be mentored. So um, people close to you have mentioned that you're very religious. How much of a role does faith play in your life and in the work that you do? I've always believed that above all else, you must be grounded in your faith. Because in the most scandalous and in the most difficult of moments, sometimes all you have is your faith. And now when you talk scandal and difficult, that's my life. And faith is all I've had. I look around me, Farai, and I don't think I am deserving to be here. I don't come from the right family. I don't have the right education credentials. I don't have the right last name. I don't have the correct type of money. I don't even have the right looks. So when I look at where I am today, how dare you tell me this can't be God? Mm. How dare you tell me that I did this by myself? Mm. But here's what I've also learned about faith. That like many good things, we have abused it as a people. So you find whether it's a conventional church or a new age church, cults have been created out of faith. So people do abuse this great thing called faith. I hear of conventional churches touching children inappropriately. And I hear of new age churches manipulating people's pain to make money out of them. We have manipulated a good thing. We must fix it. Likewise, we have done with politics. Likewise, we have done with love. Likewise, we have done with relationships. But it's something I hold so dear. Mm. I don't like to talk about it a lot because I feel my life I've given the world everything I have. From the moment I step out of my house until I get back in, the world sucks everything out of me. And the only, one of the only things I have, perhaps, is my children and my faith. And your faith to so I, I don't really talk about it much, but I am a man of faith. Congratulations on the birth of your son, Treasure Lumumba. <laughs> For I... Being a father changes you this is my second son oh. my first son is from nine years ago his name is Christian and he's the reason I decided to commit my life to politics because I wanted to shape what his world will look like now this one this little one treasure is treasure is the one who made me decide what type of politician I wanted to be I love him so much I mean I tell you I kiss this boy all the time. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it is okay for anybody to kiss a child that much. I mean, I kiss him all the time. Aww. I love him, and he makes me very happy, but I know that's not what we're here to talk about. But thank you for the congratulations. It's, it's a little different to see you um, in, this, in, in this light. You obviously have so much love for your sons. I do, I do. I, lo I love my kids so much because... They make me feel like a child again. You know, I feel I relive my childhood through them. Everything I never had, I want them to have. Every decision I make is about them. Uh, and I feel they're a representation or a reflection of all the other children we have in the country. AC, as we close the interview, what is your advice to uh, your fellow Zimbabweans um, as the nation uh, is going through its transition, its rebuilding, mm -hmm. and its rebranding. You know, I've had the privilege for right now to reach out 
and speak to different facets of Zimbabwe. I now, I have 10 year olds who scream my name when I get to an <laughs> airport. I have white Zimbabweans who hug me on an, on an airplane. I'm like, I've never really been hugged by white people in my life. I have Anambuya Veguma Musha right in the rural areas who say we learnt of YouTube because we wanted to watch your videos. And I would say this, Zimbabweans are some of the smartest people in the world. My advice to Zimbabweans is, there is nobody we should be looking or expecting to come and clean this house. The only way house Zimbabwe becomes so clean that everybody wants to visit it is if we clean it ourselves. You look at what happened in Rwanda. Rwandians came back to clean up Rwanda. Mm -hmm. You look at what happened to the Jewish. The Jews went back to clean up Israel. You look at what happened to the story of Zimbabwe the first time round. Zimbabweans came back and made this country beautiful under the GNU, and then we then lost some. My advice is the only way we clean a house mm -hmm. is if you bring your ideas and we use them to clean a house. So we attract bandits of investors, speculative investors, because we're not clean. But who's supposed to clean us? So we must clean ourselves. So for Zimbabwe to attract the whole world, and to attract all the capital, we must not only clean our country, we must clean our thoughts, we must clean our mouths, and we must clean our actions. That's my advice to the rest of the country. AC Lumumba, a name to certainly remember. Mm -hmm. I thank you profusely, AC. Thank you. For opening up to us. Thank you. Congratulations mm -hmm. on Treasure. Oh, man. And happy birthday to Christian. Thank you. According to Forbes, Africa, he's either crazy or brave. You make the decision, but you certainly will remember his name, AC Lumumba. Thank you so much for participating and watching this interview.